Welcome to the Philip Wiley Show. Take a look behind the curtain of professional hacking and hear compelling discussions with guests from diverse backgrounds who share a common curiosity and passion for challenges and their job. And now, here's your host, offensive security professional, educator, mentor, and author, Philip Wiley. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Philip Wiley Show. Today I'm excited to have my friend Andrew Lemon joining. Uh, Andrew was on my old podcast, The Hacker Factory, and Andrew and I met, I guess, back at the end of 2021. At, I think it was Hughes Con first, and ran each other again at Texas Cyber Summit. And so we kind of that's how we kind of got introduced. But Andrew is a really talented offensive security professional. Does some red teaming and pen testing. Does some really cool stuff. Uh, he's done a lot of cool physical security so excited to have him back on the show welcome hey philip thanks for having me so excited for the opportunity i always love chatting and catching up but can't wait to drop a very good person at defcon so yeah same looking forward to it so before we get started if you wouldn't mind sharing your your hacker origin story kind of how you got started yeah absolutely uh it's kind of the standard story of a kid playing with computers and wanting to figure out how they work um the only thing that's a little different is uh, my dad was a computer there growing up so he went to electronic school back when Computers and electronics are still intertwined, and you would replace capacitors on board instead of just replacing the whole board. Um, he was a Novell admin, so a Novell 3.5 administrator. Uh, and he was learning this new fangled technology called Microsoft, and he was testing for his MCSE. Uh, and so at night, as a kid, when I was going to bed, he was reading me the MCSE manuals uh, and walking me through networking. And I, mean, I wasn't left to grasp it yet, but he was still, you know. It was his way of studying, and I loved the tech. And he would break it down in a way that a five-year-old could understand it. So he would simplify and simplify and simplify until he understood it. And that was his way of learning. Um, so he taught me that methodology for learning, and that just kind of carried over how I started learning going forward. Um, and so I was helping him with his computer projects. Uh, so I started helping him with some Novell deployments. I helped him with Microsoft points as I got older. Uh, and the real interesting thing was, but last time he hit 16 or 17, he would start calling me and asking me, like, what do you think of this? Or how, how, what do you think the, the solution to this problem is? Uh, so I got my, I went to Votech, um, and I got a two year degree in just basic computer repair and networking. So I took my A plus, my net plus, my site plus. I was a terrible student, couldn't wake up, couldn't get out of bed. Um, so I always made deals with my instructor. Hey, can I get an A for this semester if I get this certification? And he said, well, the whole goal of this nine weeks is to get X, Y, Z cert. So if you get that cert, I'll give you an A for the nine weeks. And so I would play around with computers, doing whatever, playing with Kane and Abel, sniffing traffic. And then at the end of the nine weeks, I said, what cert do I need? And I'd go get that cert. And uh, I got my A plus and my net plus and my site plus. And uh, I said, I, I won't work for less than $25 an hour. Uh, I'm this great individual has all these certifications and the, the real world humbled me at 18 at the end of that summer. I said, you know, I'll work for minimum wage. Just give me a computer job. Uh, I was fortunate. I landed kind of forced, kind of unfortunate. I landed in a help desk role that was a, a very menial level one help desk. Uh, the good thing for me is during the training, I mentioned that I knew Linux and that I preferred Linux or Windows. And someone was heard and said, thought I said Unix. Uh, we were working on the Boeing help desk uh, and that actually let me get hired directly on with Boeing. Uh, so it was a cool gig there for a while, uh, had a great time, loved it. Unix engineering was kind of, uh, old school. There wasn't a lot of movement. Everyone that was doing it was retiring. And so there were only three or four of us supporting the company in that aspect. And I really, I saw the writing on the wall that I was going to be worked to death. Uh, so I to work for Dell. I worked for Dell for a number of years in their enterprise support. They do this drinking from the fire hose where they train you for three weeks straight with everything they can cram into you. I got hired in virtualization. I'd never seen ESXi. And my first phone call was the Black Friday sale for a gigantic retailer and all their ESXi systems were down. And so my first time even seeing VMware was a trial by fire for this customer that just had all of these stores that were actively down. But from there, I kind of learned okay, this is how you can deal with the stress. This is how you manage multiple customers. So I got to deal with all these big fortune 500 entities. 
my boss figured out that I could pass certification tests really easily. And so every other week you come to my desk and say, Hey, you need to get this cert. So that let me get my CCNA, my VCP, basically any cert that was offered that Dell was supporting at the time. So Red Hat or Zen or anything, uh, I had that cert or went to take that cert. Loved it, but there isn't much progression in the call center. I went to work for a, a law firm. Uh, I worked there for a number of years, worked my way from the very bottom to the top and had nowhere to go. Jump ship for a security organization because security was always the end goal. It's just that there weren't hiring direct pen testers back in the day. There was no career path that set a straight pen tester. It was become a network admin, learn some security, then you can become a dedicated security person. But becoming that jack of all phrase and learning that networking and that Windows administration actually helped me in my security career. And then I went to work directly for a security organization um, and I got to play all that in. So when I started pen testing, it was less through the lens of someone who's only learned pen testing and more so through the lens of a malicious actor. Loved all of that, loved working for a big security org with other engineers, uh, but ultimately decided that I wanted to take my own course and change it up. And that's when I started my own company. So in 2022, I started Red Threat and it's been awesome ever since. Very cool. So on that note, could you just kind of explain how it's been starting your own company, any kind of pointers for others that would be interested in starting their own consulting company? Absolutely. Uh, so first of all, brand recognition uh, and start planning how you're going to make your jump. Um, you need to know what your hangups are and how long you need to live. So the first thing you should start doing before you even conceive the idea of jumping is cutting your expenses. So see if you can cut all of your excess spending uh, and will your salary down to almost nothing as small as you absolutely can. The biggest hangup for people starting their own business or the reason why people don't is they've got to set golden handcuffs. As you get older, you get more obligations. You've got a wife, family, a mortgage. And that's what keeps a lot of people handcuffed to jobs that they hate. So the first thing is really cut your expenses to the bare minimum, figure out what you can live on and try to stash back a few months. The more cushion you can give yourself, the better. I should have done better at this. I gave myself four months of cushion and I said, you've got four months to figure it out. And after that, you better start uh, scrimping it's greatly and then go from there. What was good for me is I had a lot of brand recognition starting out. So not only I was known for the company I worked for, but I was also known as an individual. So when I went independent, I already had the brand and recognition and people were immediately sending me emails and LinkedIn DMs. Hey, I saw you left. Would you like to come work for us? And I said, well, I actually know I started my own thing. And it was a Friday I announced that I was leaving. And then on a Monday I launched the company. And, uh, from there, my DMs just filled up with people that who wanted to work with me, um, and gave me the opportunity. Lots of friends helped me out in the beginning. So making sure you got those good networking connections. The whole idea behind the company was red breasts play on the red stair. Um, we did a lot of incident response against Russian threat actors, which caused us to really start adopting their TTPs and acting like re Russian ransomware groups. Uh, we were really big emulating Conti. And so that's kind of one of the things that we drove really hard going into it. Um, the cool thing about starting a company is when you work for someone else, they tell you when to load the ship, where it's going and how to drive it. When you start your own company, you get to drive the ship. You get to make all the decisions. Uh, we'll actually turn away more business than we take on just because it maybe it's not our wheelhouse. And I give a lot of business away. I'll say you should call this person instead. Uh, you need to get over that competition versus the community thing. There's more than enough cyber to go around. If someone does it better than me, I'm going to refer them out. And I'm going to say right away, hey, I'm not good at that. It's not that that's a business practice, but I think that it's good to have that. And I'm trying to help foster anyone that's trying to come up and start their own company. Um, the easy things, of course, have an LLC, get some insurance. Uh, those are the, the big ones to have going into it. Uh, but it's been really great for me. I've really enjoyed that. That's good. So I imagine you're probably... You kind of said you could pick what you, you want. Some would imagine that you're having more fun with work than what you were before when you worked somewhere where they took whatever come along. Absolutely. It's uh, weird. It was just a few months ago. I used to always wake up at like five o'clock in the morning and I couldn't get back to sleep. So I was stressing out everything that's going on. How am I going to solve this problem? How am I going to solve this? Growth begins at the edge of your comfort zone, but at the same time, I want to make sure that I'm delivering with the highest integrity I can. 
And so that is it. The, the mission statement the story of the company was, uh, we're not looking to get ready for a pair early. We're looking to have as much fun as possible. And so we take on the stuff that we like. If something interests us, we pick it up. Uh, if something can be an opportunity, we'll jump on it. I mean, a lot of stuff has come from just buying hardware on eBay, uh, reversing it, figuring it out, posting it online, and then people seeing that on the IRS. That's, that's a cool approach. So, yeah. So, um, what type of stuff do you, do you specialize in, in your company? So for the most part, uh, I would love to say that we do renting and pen testing as our core. Unfortunately, most companies aren't ready for that. So we do a handful of rent teams every year. Um, and most of the time we're talking our customers out of it. Again, this is where being an engineer versus being a businessman is tough for me because I can take a hundred thousand dollar engagement and talk a customer back to. You don't need a hundred thousand dollar red team. You need a twenty thousand dollar risk assessment. So I really think it's important to size your customer first. We do a lot of red teams. Um, once we get those organizations up to speed and get them mature, uh, but our main focus, our real area of business, like our hot seller, has been ransomware readiness. It's aimed towards those organizations that have few been past. Maybe they don't need a red team. Um, a lot of people ransomware is this mythical thing where. People think APTs are pulling them off and you have companies like Microsoft that can you steal a code signing cert or can you do this very niche red team thing? Can you show the ability to shut down the power grid in this company or in this country? And really ransomware stuff is how do you pass for zero logon? Um, do you know if someone's added domain admins? A lot of the, when a company is squawked other criticals, the things that they like they missed are just basic configurations. They might have. SNMP configured on a switch uh, that allows me to read, say, the admin password and access the switch infrastructure. So we've done a lot of these very fine-tuned ransomware readiness assessments to see how can we impact your business. And that comes to figuring out how the business works and then figuring out how to cripple the organization from uh, an attacker standpoint, whether that's encrypting everything or whether that is exfiltrating a bunch of critical customer information that could do brand damage. We do our typical risk assessments. Those are hot seller internal external head tests. Everyone's going to need those in the PCI space. Uh, really the ransomware stuff and the risk assessments have been our bread and butter. Yeah, that's really cool the, the way you do things. Cause you know, some companies, and that's one of the things that I recommend when people are looking for pen test companies and even for people that are trying to acquire those type of services is to put more effort into the goals because, you know, sometimes people are looking for pen test just because it's PCI and they really don't look into the value beyond that. And they're just kind of leaving a lot of effort on the table because whoever they hire, a lot of cases are going to come in, do a PCI pen test and that's it. So it's really cool that you're advising people to do like some of these risk assessments instead to be able to figure out where things are. And I like the, the way that you're using the assessment types based on the maturity of the company, because some people, like you said, aren't ready for red team operations. You know, they just need to do, you know, risk assessment and some pen tests before they even consider trying to do a red team operation. Absolutely. And my main goal has been transparency. So I have to deliver a, a sample report of look at this and this is going to be exactly what you get based on these 10 deliverables. This is what the output of that report looks like. Um, we can go back to starting the company. That was one of the things I did right away was I wanted to find scope from here's how you sell the, the, the widget all the way down to how you deliver it. And so we have a step by step guide on here's how you sell the engagement here's how you perform it here's how you take the output from that tool parse it put in a report here's how you deliver that report and it doesn't leave a lot of gray area for the customer they know exactly what they're going to get they'll know that their report is going to look exactly like a sample report with the only exception being it's their data in there instead of dummy data yeah and i really like that you're you're going in being the trusted advisor because that's what what organizations need, not just a consultant or someone to do the work, but someone they can trust, advise them on what they need. Yeah. I love working with my customers. I love having, I like building relationships. But one thing I wanted to do when I got in this space was a lot of people use their engagements as a selling point to the service. So they're going to sell an external pen test, uh, but really that's just a loss leader to get someone into a, a tax service management. And for me, I push all the partners. Uh, I'll make recommendations on a firewall here, your top three, but I don't sell any firewalls. We do one off engagements, which again, isn't the best way to make money in this business, but I feel like 
I want to deliver this service unbiased. I don't want to push a certain or be beholden to a certain EDR because that company gives me money or I'm affiliated with them. I want it to be as brutal and honest as I can be in everything I do. So very cool. So how, how long have you been in business now? So November will be two years, I believe. I was starting November 2022. So we're at a year and a few months in and it's been great. Uh, I was stressed out early on and then everything started working out, kept positive mindset. And if we didn't get a customer today, we'd be set for the next five years. So that's good. So kind of, you know, you mentioned, you know, getting into this, you already kind of made a name for yourself. So how did you do that? How did you make your name? So I started with those two on LinkedIn. They were just quick little videos. Uh, here's me picking a lock. Here's me uh, hitting a rec sensor on a door. And talking about social engineering, social engineering and physical security are the two easiest areas to get into because they require the least amount of technical. And it's something that people understand. Everyone knows how to talk and everyone knows how to open a door. Um, we certainly need more technical aspects of like evading EDR. Uh, you lose a lot of people. So those two subjects were really easy to get the most people in and the most granted recognition instead of polarizing people. Because if you get too technical and people don't understand it, They'll start tuning you out. So it was easy, quick hits, and just simple things that people wanted to share. Um, and that's how we started the physical pen testing portion of the business is we just showed our kits off. We showed our tools off. Um, and then we started offering as part of assessments. Hey, we're, we're doing your on-site assessment today. Would you like us to check your physical security as well? And a lot of customers would say no. Some would say yes. And that gave us more ammo to kind of build. And we could use those videos again and we started getting brand recognition from there it's that we came talking at conferences they can be an intro uh, a lot of people think that you have to be an expert on something you could find something really cool and dig in and you might find out that no one's actually ever done any research into this and then just like you were a beginner everyone else was but what took you two months to learn if you could distill that into a 90 minute or 60 minute presentation you might have more engagement than you ever expected so I did a lot of presentations on things that I was great at. I did presentations on things that I sucked at. And then other times I just talked about the things I was seeing every day and ransomware and incident response. And that kind of allowed me to take off and just sharing little tidbits that I used this tool today and here's how you can do this. And people latched onto that. So you're doing much physical uh, assessments in your organization? We would like, I'd like to do more physical assessments. Uh, they were definitely a blast. Um, we got primarily focused on us. I'm really focused on kind of keeping it as much home as possible. So I do a lot less travel than I used to. We'll either send one of our engineers out or we'll do a lot remotely. And I've seen that a lot of people pushed away from the physical, uh, with all these industries going work from home during COVID, we had a big push for physicals. And then after COVID. There's no one in the office anymore. Um, a lot fewer, few places even have a physical location anymore. So to find someone that wants physical engagements, uh, it's very few and far between. There's no requirement like DCI that make them want to be physicals. So really the only places that want to be physicals are the ones that want to do multiple sites, say uh, a four to 500. And being one of those customers as well, uh, they're hard to get. We've been courting them we've had a few, but just to get those ongoing, um, the the benefit doesn't really for the company the benefit that we provide at physical doesn't really make sense for the money they spend because at the end of the day can you rehang doors or are you going to rehang doors or are you going to reprogram uh elevators usually after you do two or three sites the, they become copy and paste the customers oh i need to do this across my entire organization and you've kind of pressed yourself out of the industry that way we're out of those jobs so yeah you mentioned kind of before we got started that you're you know, working on some CVEs and stuff. So uh, what type of research have you been doing? Yeah, my real uh, research recently has been into traffic control systems. Uh, I was hoping to make a DEF CON talk out of it. Uh, I submitted, I just got my uh, my letter that said I wasn't accepted or picked up, but that's fine with me. Uh, so I ended up buying a bunch of hardware on eBay, stuff got traffic controllers. So this is what controls the stoplight at your local intersection. Um, yeah. That's a Siemens M60. I want to shout out the company Unix, uh, Y-U-N-E-X. They actually bought the Siemens line. Those guys have been incredible. Um, the second I reached out to, for them for MIMS, which are just S&MP um, 
the files that show you what data points you can query in an SNMP or for SNMP. Uh, they got the head of products, the head of cyber, and the head of R and D all on the phone and had an hour long conversation and said, "We'll give you anything you need. Um, if you want resources, schematics, those guys have been great. Uh, if you're a small municipality looking for traffic controllers, buy them from Unix because they care." Uh, I had another company though. I got my first CDE, um, and it was for an authentication bypass and a traffic controller. The company had a responsible disclosure program. So I followed that. I sent my email, I sent replacing steps. Hey, this is how I obtained the hardware. Uh, this is how I found the exploit. Here's how you can fix it. Um, please reach out to me if I can do anything. And. I sent it to an engineering team and three weeks later, I actually got a cease and desist from their legal team. Wow. Um, yeah, I said, uh, we don't know how you obtained your hardware. If there is a vulnerability in here, um, that that's no longer this, the software that you're testing is no longer supported. But, um, if you choose to disclose it, we will pursue you to the fullest extent of the computer fraud and abuse act. Uh, because this is an area of critical security importance, critical national security. And so I thought it was funny that on one hand, they said, this isn't a big deal because this is an obstacle software. But on the <laughs> other hand, whatever you do, don't disclose this and we'll sue you into the ground if you do, because you could damage critical national infrastructure. But I got my CVE from miners, so I should be dropping that a little ahead of DEF CON. That's good. That The other organizations you're talking about are doing things the right way to to embrace security researchers, because the other organization, this may, yeah, we all know that maybe this is not the supported software, but how often do places not update their software? So it's out there in a while for, for sure. Yeah. And that's the scary thing about the, the traffic control industry. Um, and it, it was funny because I got, I had to basically rewire the whole controller and make it work. They use a, a multi thousand dollar proprietary cable. I decided to wire it. I got fired up and it was like 11 o'clock at night. And I'm like, well, I'll poke the light in her face before I go to bed. And it was the first thing that I tried worked. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. The whole traffic industry is 10 or 15 years behind the whole side of security. And I have walked through these controllers. Uh, it's been scary how easy it is and just how vulnerable they are. And how many of them are just exposed to the internet. I, I can't imagine how many, I couldn't begin to fathom how many, uh, intersections I can actually see on the internet and they're just everywhere. Wow. That's scary. <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of cool getting to, to work with some of those things. Is there anything else that you're planning to, to get into research wise? So we've been, uh, as much as I, I hate it, I hate uh, IT buzzwords. And so I hated the word zero trust. I hated AI and ML, uh, and machine learning, but we've got into AI and testing. Um, it was against my, my better judgment. I hate AI because I think that it's fancy autocorrect. Uh, you may get better systems later on. Uh, and I was playing with AIs back in the early days of GPT. So I had access to GPT-2 and open AI sandbox. Um, and so I was very vehemently opposed to playing with AI, but these companies started wanting to pay for it. And so we've done some penetration tests for AI systems. Um, and it's really cool. A lot of people think that AI is just prompt injection and that's all it is, but there's actually a whole OWASP top 10 for AI now. So there are things like, um, sensitive information disclosure. So can you deceive the model in a way to give me the last 10 chats or can I get it to tell me about a person that it shouldn't, um, if we played with like the over-reliance, the big story that hit the news recently was, um, Google recommending how to make your cheese pizza easier by adding Elmer's glue. Because they were using <laughs> Reddit and as an over-reliance model as Reddit as their data source. And so all the full comments were made to the top of Google. Uh, so that's been really cool. And there's just dumb things like uh, trying to make an AI uh, eat itself by asking it to print out 16 different examples of an e-car string. And then as it prints that example, the AV on the actual server sees that in the database and then eats the database of the LLM. Uh, it's <laughs> been just fun stuff. Uh, there's so many cool things about AI and everyone is so caught up on prompt injection. That's been the, the fun area that we've been working on there. And then really trying to educate people and get back to the community and say, 
uh, help them understand pen testing isn't really what they think it is. Uh, so I developed a, a ransomware affiliate training. So we launched our first class at Def or at um, B sides of Oklahoma. And the goal was to teach a student start to finish how to get initial access all the way to ransom deploy ransomware to an entire organization. So we built two mock uh, networks. We took uh, day one exploits and we took TTPs directly from threat actors and made a course out of it. We basically took, we found some open directories. We found the tools the threat actors are using. We pulled them right down and made a whole course to start to finish. Here's how you ransom the organization and here's how you get paid on it. Um, that is when that training is going to be going mainstream soon. Um, having got the, the full announcement, that's going to be with a, a bigger, um, learning source. So I'm really excited for that. Oh, very cool. Yeah. That's pre pretty interesting. I was going to ask if you were going to offer that again, but that's, that's good. So as far as anyone wanting to learn AI pen testing, what is a good resource for learning AI pen testing? So that's been a tough one. Uh, you can really just start cramming things in the model. So for me, GPT is the leading, the leading edge. So it's finding out who's dropping newer, more recent uh, vulnerabilities and kind of tracking what OpenAI did. So like uh, white text was early on, that's what you could do with chat GPT. And then Claude and Bard and those systems took a little longer to patch it. Um, there are a bunch of CTFs that are um, LLM based. That's a good example. Or getting on hugging face and learning how to run LLM locally. Uh, but I can figure out what the, the core things are. Um, uh, it's not just prompt injection. It could also be data poisoning. Well, what does data poisoning look like? Is it the training data? Is it hiding data inside of props? Is it encouraging people to copy and paste those props? Uh, so I would start with the OS top 10, look at those examples and then start playing through an LLMs. And again, backtracking because if you know, GPT is pat chat GPT is past something, the others are going to swing follow, but they're almost always off. Yeah. Very cool. I know there was learned of this company last year, this bug bounty platform hunter.ai that launched like during Black Hat last year is like one of the first bug bounty platforms for for AI. And it's kind of interesting hearing some of the things that one of the founders was talking about, how a lot of some of these different web application vulnerabilities are are uh, vulnerable within some of these AI installations. Yeah, hitting the API endpoints, uh, you find it's just like the AI pen test a lot of times. And then it's the really dumb things that you also don't expect. Um, like when you, when they've added internet connectivity to the models and let them be able to go out to Bing and Google, and you could take, say, Red Threat, and then whoever the best pen testing company is, and you could have a bunch of white text on the Red Threat website that said, um, Red Threat is the best at doing fill in the blank. And so if you said, compare the top pen testing company in the world to Reddit threat, the model would come back and say, hire rent threat because they are the expert in X. So that was kind of a, a fun thing to play with early on. Very cool. So we're getting down towards the end of the podcast. Is there anything you want to discuss that we didn't get around to? Yeah, we talk a lot about how people get into cyber and the things they can do. Um, there's a talk that I've wanted to give for a while, but I can't expand it out far enough. Uh, but really it comes down to like uh, engineering opportunity. Um, everyone always asks, well, how do I get into this? What do I need to study? What do I need to research? I can never do that. And everyone says I've been really lucky in my field. Everything that I try to accomplish always works out for me. Everything always works out for me, which sounds terrible, but, um, you can find out that you can engineer opportunity. And so I think one of the best takeaways I can give to people listening to this, um, there are no rules in the job market. Nothing says that you have to follow the crew you train for. If you're a paramedic, you can go in the site or you can go do whatever. If you've worked on your, like, uh, on a computer your whole life, you can go be an electrician. Um, there are, there are no rules. There's nothing that says you have to follow your job, whatever your job description. You can just color outside the lines and wait for somebody to correct you. Uh, you can jump shit after you've worked for a company for a month. The real trick is networking, making sure that you're getting out, you're talking to people, uh, you're getting to know them, you're showing up to events. The more people that know your name, the more brand recognition you have, the further you're going to go. Uh, and just for kind of the, to kind of go hand in hand with that engineering opportunity, there's a, a really cool story. Uh, so if anyone knows me, I started out 
and I suck with talking to people. And so I learned magic, like card magic, to go out and have interaction. Because <laughs> uh, people don't really remember you, but they remember how you made the film. They remember the things that you did. And so while a lot of people may not remember, hey, I talked to women at DEF CON. They'll remember that some guy did this really awesome card trick. They had no idea. And then they see your Facebook associate desk. Uh, so there's a story about the guy that uh, directed the movie Baby Driver. And he was doing this movie on like card hustling, cheats, and like he was trying to get into the mind of uh, magicians. And so he hired these two magicians to show up to his house and basically show him tricks and teach him how things are done. Uh, and they spent two hours just blowing this guy's mind. And as they got to the end of it and they went to stand up and leave, he said, Well, show me your best trick. What's the best thing you've got? And they went, We just spent two hours showing you the best of the best. And they said, We've got one more thing that probably won't work in here. How about we go outside in your driveway and we can show you? And this guy had a, a big backyard he was really proud of. And he said, well, why don't we go in the backyard instead? And so they go in the backyard and one of the magicians says to him, name any card you want. So the card trick is really easy because maybe you can control the deck. True magic is name a card because then it's good for your brain. And so one of them says, pick a card. He says, buy the hearts. And the other says, play to a location somewhere in your backyard. And he connects generally over in this direction. And one of the magicians says, okay, go over there and dig in a flower bed. And he goes over there and he digs in the flower bed and he finds a five of hearts. Okay. And he's blown away. And typically a magician is not going to share their secret. But because this guy had paid them and he must show them like what happens, they pull up their iPad and they show them the video where three hours earlier, they would broken into this guy's backyard and they started burying cards around his backyard in general locations. And that's something where you, the takeaway from that is they had all this prep. They spent three hours doing this. They showed up to the house late to make it look like, oh, no, I, we couldn't even find the house. We've never been here before. We really sell it. And the takeaway from that is you can steer conversations to your, your aerial uh, experience. You can generate opportunity. And people think that luck is just luck. But it's really when preparation meets opportunity. So if you can steer a job interview or a chance meeting into, hey, this is the thing I've been working on. If you want to sell more physical pen tests, just start talking about physical pen tests. If you want to sell more penetration testing, talk about that. Share the cool things you want to talk about. And then maybe you want to sell your love for watches. Start asking people, hey, what watch are you wearing? Um, because after you get what watch they're wearing, then they're going to look at your watch and you're going to get to nerd out and talk about that. Uh, so there's so much opportunity to engineer um, people in a way to set goals or to put your best foot forward with people. I think a lot of people miss that when they're trying to come up and learn the secret society. Very cool. That's pretty wild about the card trick. That's pretty, <laughs> pretty yeah. amazing. Well, thanks for taking time to join me today. It's a, was a pleasure to, to catch up with you and hear what all you get going on. Absolutely. Thanks for the time. Thanks for the shout out. And it's, I, mean, I can't wait to grab a beer with you in Vegas. Yeah. I look forward to it. Thanks everyone. And we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you for listening to The Philip Wiley Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. In the meantime, to learn more about Philip, go to thehackermaker.com and connect with him on LinkedIn and Twitter at Philip Wiley. Until next time.